Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Industrial Processes Fast Pitch Session. My name is Catherine Greco. I'm a fellow here at RPE, and I'll be moderating. Today, you're going to hear five fast pitches followed by Q&A. And so if you have questions, please submit them using the QR code either on your badge or on the screen here. The theme for today is industry. Heavy industry is responsible for about 25% of global CO2 emissions and 35% of energy use. It's also a super difficult to decarbonize sector, given its scale, extreme process conditions like high temperatures and pressures, and reliance on carbon both as a fuel and as a reducing agent. So in order to decarbonize, we have three potential pathways. One is to find drop-in replacements. Another is to replace these fuels with non-carbon sources. And the third is to electrify. And due to the scale of the problem, it's likely that we're going to need a combination of all three solutions. And so today, we're going to be talking about all three. You'll hear about drop-in replacements for sustainable aviation fuel and coke, about new technologies and pathways for industrial electrification, and of course, about hydrogen. And so without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Doug Wicks, who's going to tell us about where we're going to get all of this hydrogen. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, so today I want to talk to you about resetting the hydrogen paradigm to really say how can we make it a primary energy source as we go through. And so this is kind of a reboot of discussion we had last year. And what I would like to do is kind of walk you through some different ideas to think about. And okay. All right, now that I figured out the right button there. Um, what I want to talk about, there's suddenly a lot of news about geologic hydrogen. On the bottom down there is uh, an article that came out in Science just recently, last month, talking about hidden hydrogen. Uh, there's a number of other reports coming up around the world from France talking about hydrogen, natural hydrogen that we can use. Um, there's been reports in Germany and Der Spiegel talking about natural hydrogen as a source to go forward. Is it the energy uh, source for the future? And even the New York Times has pulled up with an opinion piece to say, is there something hiding under our feet that we haven't thought about? And, and the question I'm going to be talking about today is, what's all the buzz about? Uh, first of all, we have to think th that hydrogen is going to be a key component of the energy transition. Today, we use hydrogen for making fertilizer and industrial processes. And our production is somewhat under 100 million tons per year, almost all of it coming from natural gas and coal. And, but in the future, we're going to be looking at the use of hydrogen in many areas. You hear discussions today about the uses of hydrogen. You've heard it in the meetings. Where we're now going to shift it into can we make fuels out of it? Can we do transportation with it? Can we make materials, heating, electricity, and storage? And the IEA is projecting that in 2050, uh, we're going to require about 520 million tons of uh, clean hydrogen, 200 million tons being blue hydrogen and 320 million tons being green hydrogen that I'll talk to you about going forward. And we look at blue hydrogen, it's a fairly straightforward process. Say we're going to take the existing steam methane reforming processes where we're going to take natural gas from under our feet uh, you'll find that all of my solutions start under our feet. So natural gas comes up, goes into a steam reformer, um, and we go through a separations unit, which gives us hydrogen. And in the future, instead of spewing the carbon dioxide into the air, we're going to put it into storage uh, to make it so-called blue hydrogen. Uh, electrolysis of water is also a source of hydrogen. It's been around since 1789. So this is where we get... Uh, green hydrogen from is the color, and I'm not a great fan of colors for this. But you take water, pass through electricity, and you get hydrogen. But many people don't realize that it also starts under our feet, even though it's water. Because we need metals for the electrodes. We need materials for the wind and solar capacity to, to make this clean. Uh, so it pretty much also starts under our feet. But they have their drawbacks, both blue and green hydrogen. First of all, they're both energy carriers. We took one source of energy and converted it into hydrogen. And in blue hydrogen, we, got to we have to sequester gigatons of CO2 annually, and we have potential for leaks. 
green hydrogen, we're going to need tens of millions of tons of critical minerals to generate this hydrogen. And it needs lots of wind and solar for renewable sources. So what else is beneath our feet? This came out of the recent science article. It's a very complex structure. But really, the headline is, it's Earth is a hydrogen factory. Um, and we can talk about where it comes from specifically. And in this, one type is radiolysis, the reaction of radioactive decay process of wood water to generate hydrogen. Very important, and we'll come back to this, is a mineral oxidation, water plus these reduced minerals uh, to generate the oxides plus hydrogen. And then in the deep earth sources of this, there's hydrogen coming up, which we really don't know where from, so we just say it's deep earth. But I want to keep your eye, bring your attention towards the oxidation process, taking iron two plus water to go to iron three oxides and hydrogen. Um, it's important because 5% of the Earth's crust uh, is iron two. So it's a, one of the most abundant uh, elements beneath our feet. And the crust is, again, for those of you who haven't thought about it, it's that top surface area of the Earth that's readily accessible to us. So it's a kind of a key reaction to look at. So what's the potential? Everyone asks me, how much is there? And you know, first you have to come back and say, how much of the Earth can we get you know, access with current drilling technologies? So how far can we go down? Which is about seven kilometers. Uh, and then if we get about 1.4 kilograms of hydrogen per ton of iron, too, and you do go through the math process, we're talking about 10 to the 15 tons or more of hydrogen potential. Uh, for those of you who don't like big numbers, that's millions of billions of tons uh, of hydrogen is beneath our feet. So where on earth should we be looking for this? We need to know a lot. We need to know the types of minerals, the location and size, the presence of geologic seals to help us keep it in place, depth and accessibility, and how much hydrogen flux comes out of it. These are all questions that need to be answered. But luckily, the USGS has smart people who started looking prospecting for us and begin to say, where could we find hydrogen uh, in the United States for exploitation? And this is a really neat map. I think you're going to see this a lot in the future. The high parts of red zones that are in there, this is where the models in this example, which is still early on, we think there's going to be a large amount of hydrogen. For those of you familiar with oil and gas, you'll notice that there is almost an exclusion between where we find oil and gas and where we're going to find hydrogen in the future. So it's a really unexplored area for us uh, in the world. So how do we access this? You know, the, really, the question comes back is, we have all this hydrogen. The simplistic view might be, there are natural deposits. Can we just drill down uh, into active hydrogen accumulations? Uh, and pull the hydrogen back up uh, to use it. And this is a potential. People are looking at this. Um, but what if there's not a lot there? What if we need to get more? One of the nice things about hydrogen versus hydrocarbons is the fact that it's generated on a human time scale. Um, so maybe we have to go through and stimulate it. We could take lessons from the geothermal industry to drill down a well which we're going to insert water uh, into the system oxidize the iron, generate hydrogen, and remove it, and go forward. So these are potentials that we can look at. But it's not going to be easy. There are some real challenges that we have to face and opportunities. This is why it's important for RPE to look at it. First, we're going to need geologists to go out and find where this material is. Because again, it's not in areas we've looked at before. The systems are different. Uh, we're going to need chemists chemistry to go out and say, how do we catalyze, control, and stimulate this reaction? And probably even more importantly, we're going to need engineers to really manage and access these reservoirs and extract the material from the earth. So if you have ideas to unleash its potential from geologic hydrogen, uh, if so, come see me over coffee in the morning. Um, drop me an email. I'm more than happy to talk to people about this. Maybe ask me about an upcoming workshop that's going forward. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jim Seba, who's going to talk about a potential use of hydrogen, which is making sustainable fuels. Uh.
Thanks, Doug. Appreciate that. Hi, my name's Jim Seba. I'm the newest member of the uh, <clears throat> program directors here at RPE and really happy to be here. Be here. Been here for two, two and a half months. So today I'm reaching out to everybody in the audience to really help me develop a program around synthetic fuels as I'll discuss here today. RPE's mission is to, RPE's mission is to um, uh, advance energy innovation and create a secure, sustainable, and affordable energy future. Affordable and sustainable energy projects that address our 2050 <clears throat> net zero goals is very, very challenging. In part, to do and address these type of goals, we need to really look at accelerating renewable power and going beyond the grid, and also leveraging our current infrastructure. So what I wanted to talk to you today about is looking at next generation power to liquids. First we have <clears throat> the next generation power to liquids shown here. On the left hand side, you take renewable power, wind, solar energy, again converting that to hydrogen through electrolysis. Doug gave a nice diagram of how one does that, or green hydrogen. But then you're taking the hydrogen, combining that with CO2, where you gather the CO2 either from direct air capture or industrial processes, or what have you. So once you have that and you combine the two together, then you have to have a reactor synthetic processing system to be able to convert that into fuel. In this case, we're going to look at liquid fuels that are actually difficult to um, decarbonize or electrify their end products. But really what I want to focus on in this system is the reactor system. And why is that? Well, first of all, on the renewable side, the cost of solar and wind have come down considerably over the last several years or decades. So that, <clears throat> so they have a, a large amount of people and industries working in that space. And then combine that with electrolysis, and new generation electrolysis, again, has significantly reduced the cost of hydrogen using these renewable resources. And those costs are greatly reduced when you can decouple from the grid and hook up directly. So with those new technologies, that's one of the main drivers behind developing a new reactor system that can handle these intermittent hydrogen inputs. And of course, then the CO2 comes from, again, either direct air capture or industrial processes such as an ethanol plant that then convert that into your liquid fuel. So the liquid fuels are looking at, again, are sustainable aviation and renewable diesel fuels. I'll just call them SARD for short right now. Well, <clears throat> how big of a difference does it make? Again, 27% of GHG emissions in the US are from transportation, Rob mentioned that. Um, the majority of them can be addressed through direct electrification, through battery vehicles, but the larger vehicles, such as semi-trucks and uh, aircraft, are much more difficult uh, to electrify. So therefore, utilizing these type of fuels can then definitely accelerate us toward this net zero carbon goal that we're all trying to achieve. Well, of course, the oil industry is very busy also supplying SARD type fuels. And to do this, they have been gathering all the fats, oils, and greases around the planet and then gathering them in their, uh, and leveraging their resources, the refineries, and producing these type of fuels. It's a very difficult process and a very somewhat expensive process, like five to seven dollars a gallon for these type of fuels based upon a McKinsey and World Economic Forum paper. So once someone <clears throat> looks at those type of costs and also the 80 percent of the cost of these fuels is from the gathering of those resources, then the reduction in the future of this resource is somewhat limited. Further, just the fact that we only have so much of these resources, we can only have maybe a few hundred thousand barrels per day total. It doesn't really address the 6.5 million barrels a day the SARD fuels require in the US. So what do we do? Again, we look at renewable energy. We have lots of that. This is shown here in the United States. And what's shown is uh, the green uh, rectangle represents the amount of area required that one then could take this system and generate these SARD fuels, 6.5 million barrels a day. It's about 25% of the size of Kansas. Of course, obviously, this would be spread throughout the country, 
but it represents a real opportunity to take these um, uh, renewables and generate liquids with them to satisfy our needs. Of course, Europe has been looking at this for over 10 years. This actually shows the uh, Norsk e-fuel plant that is now being planned in Europe. However, their approach was to look at, well, we'll use higher power grid. And when they did that, they end up with a very expensive liquid fuel around $14 a gallon. The same report I mentioned earlier actually estimates this at more at $17 to $20 per gallon. So again, either case, way too expensive. So again, how do we reduce the cost of this type of fuel? Well, you have to know where the cost is generated from. Hydrogen is the big problem here. We need cheap hydrogen. Well, how cheap do we need it? That is the real question. Unfortunately, we have papers that tell us that. And of course, direct air capture, many companies working on that to reduce the cost. And of course, the cost targets there are definitely coming down from maybe 200 and hopefully toward $100 per ton. And of course, reducing the reactor cost. And that's where the area, again, a lot of people have not been working, working the reactor piece. And that's a newer area that I'd like to look into. So in short, I'm going to summarize here that I'm targeting $4 a gallon instead of the 14 or 18. Again, how to get there, well, that's enabled by $2 per kilogram hydrogen. And that's the estimate that's coming off of the current technologies that are being tested today using renewables and electrolysis. Again, behind the grid, or I call it beyond the grid. And, <clears throat> and of course, $100 a ton for CO2 will then be able to provide, again, that $4 per gallon type target. Um, also, since renewables are uh, lower, or since this process is energy intensive, as was mentioned earlier, uh, therefore, you have to have these in smaller units where we can only do 100 to maybe 1,000 barrels a day. 100 barrels a day is going to represent about 33 megawatts of power, quite a bit of power. However, since you're behind the grid, you can put that anywhere on that map I've shown previously. So again, it's an, it's an opportunity for us. And then finally, there is some synergies that when you're making these liquid fuels, you do produce a lot of water that can be recycled back to the front end. So especially in places where we have solar energy, or there may be a little less water or definitely water concerns, this helps alleviate some of that issue. And obviously, once we have these liquid fuels on the back end, we already can distribute them throughout the country, either by truck, by rail, by pipeline, uh, that was shown in earlier presentations. And of course, the end-use markets are already there for us. So it's really doing the hard work right up front. Um, this is just to represent, OK, in the reactor space, these are the newer technologies that are out there. This is more of a get your innovation, innovative juices flowing. Please reach out to me. I'm very interested in anybody that has interest in this type of space, again, looking at either modular reactors, electric reformers, plasma reformers, all these type of new technologies are coming to bear on this new reactor type system that can really address the intermittency, the smaller scale, and let us allow us to hit these cost targets. I'd be really happy to talk to you tomorrow at coffee or any time, reach out to me. My email's here, my phone number, you message me, I'll respond. Thank you very much. Now I, now I'd like to, now I'd like to uh, hand the mic over to Dr. Joe Melville. Thanks for that introduction, Jim. Uh, hey everyone, my name's Joe Melville. I'm a fellow here at RPE, and I'm excited to talk to y'all about a different type of drop-in fuel for the decarbonization of heavy industry. That's right. I'm talking about clean coal 2.0. This time it's gonna work. <laughs> Solid elemental carbon is so important because it defines basically every element we take for granted in modern civilization. It's used to refine the elemental phosphorus that goes into our battery electrolytes, our fertilizers and pesticides, the silicon in our solar panels and computer chips, the titanium in our airplanes and our prosthetic hips, to say nothing of the iron and aluminum that goes into our buildings, cars, and ships. All of it is refined by solid elemental carbon in the form of coke or occasionally graphite. In fact, if we look at the periodic table of elements, basically half of the elements on here are either refined directly by elemental carbon or indirectly through the use of elements which are themselves refined by carbon. 
And it's this intrinsic reliance on carbon in chemical reactions known as carbothermal reduction that make these industries so difficult to decarbonize. How do you remove carbon from a carbothermal reaction? Carbon is literally in the name. Several strategies suggest speculative sustainable solutions. A plethora of emerging energy technologies are unlocking revolutionary new routes to bringing clean heat and electricity to bear in decarbonizing these industries. Unfortunately, revolutionary routes require restrictively remunerative retrofitting. Uh, that, that means it's expensive. You can see here a photo of a fairly small blast furnace. And what you might notice is that for something that is fairly small, it's quite large. And that means it's expensive. In today's currency, this blast furnace costs about 800 million US dollars. A larger blast furnace can easily cost into the billions with a B. That is an insane amount of money for any company to write off as a sunk cost or stranded asset. What's worse, every industry has its own unique pathway to decarbonization. Oftentimes, these different pathways can involve entirely different primary feedstocks and may produce entirely different value-added products. By comparison, drop-in decarbonization directly draws down detrimental discharge of CO2. I promise that's the last alliteration in this talk. Um, if you take CO2 and you can reduce it to chemical fuels, you can then use those net zero fuels to power existing industrial processes in a net zero fashion. The chemistry is fundamentally identical. The input is identical. The output is identical. It's a one-size-fits-all decarbonization solution, and there are no sunk costs. So what does a drop-in replacement for Coke look like? One possibility is bio-Coke. And bio-Coke is basically charcoal. And humans have been smelting with charcoal since literal ancient history, since the Iron Age. One of the oldest recorded human professions is charcoal burner. What happened? Simply put, we ran out of trees. There is not enough arable land on Earth for us to grow biomass on the scale needed to decarbonize modern industry. So let's think about the other half of the potential umbrella of sustainable coke, synthetic coke, or syncoke. There are no shortage of potential chemical routes to producing synthetic carbon. And a linchpin reaction here is what's known as the Boudouard reaction, a chemical equilibrium by which carbon monoxide gas will react at temperatures below 700 degrees Celsius to form solid elemental carbon and CO2. What this means is if you can turn CO2 into CO, you can make carbon. And there are no shortage of ways to make CO. You can use hydrogen gas and utilize the reverse water gas shift reaction. You can use high temperature process heat from concentrated solar power or nuclear fission over non-stoichiometric oxide catalysts like ceria or perovskites to split CO2 directly. And of course, you can use electrochemistry. In fact, with electrochemistry, you can skip the Boudouard reaction entirely and directly reduce CO2 to solid carbon. So there are plenty of potential chemistries for producing synthetic carbon from CO2. And there are even a good number of research laboratories and startups operating in this space. I bet some of them are in the audience right now. However, not all carbon is created equal. The overwhelming majority of research on synthetic carbon focuses on the production of highly crystalline, highly ordered carbon products, like graphene and carbon nanotubes. And it's a fundamental principle in chemistry that the more ordered your product is, the slower you have to grow it. It's true that on a per gram basis, these carbon products are more valuable than coal. However, they also represent a much tinier fraction of the potentially global demand for synthetic carbon. And if you're just going to shovel it into a blast furnace, carbon is carbon. So here's an idea. Instead of making niche carbon products slowly, let's see just how quickly we can make low quality carbon. The fundamental challenge here is one of economics. The heavy inertia towards fossil fuels is primarily driven towards their low price. By comparison, sustainable alternative fuels like green hydrogen and sustainable aviation fuel cost substantially more than their fossil equivalents and on some level rely upon a willingness by the consumer to tolerate a green premium. But where does Syncoke fall on this scale? How much does Syncoke cost? We don't know because no one is making any. Luckily, the cross-sectoral impact of industrial carbon means we can pick and choose our battles. The big fish for decarbonization here is the iron and steel industry, which single-handedly accounts for 7% of 
all anthropogenic emissions. However, iron and steel also represents the biggest and most competitive market for industrial carbon fuels. Instead, let's look towards smaller, more tractable carbothermal industries as a means to build the necessary economies of scale needed to make synthetic coke production cost-effective in larger industries. A great example of a potential beachhead industry is the silicon photo solar photovoltaic industry because the carbothermally produced silicon in a solar panel is responsible for an outsized proportion of the embodied energy and embodied emissions associated with that solar panel. What's more, residential solar photovoltaics represent a potentially consumer-facing industry with a strong social incentive to decarbonize. If you're putting solar panels on your home, there's a decent chance you might be willing to tolerate a small increase in price to make sure that those solar panels are net zero emission. Of course, the ultimate goal here is total carbon circularity, a world where we can take any number of oxide ores and feed them into an industrial furnace and get out pure elements and oxygen gas with carbon never leaving the factory loop. So many of the resources that we take for granted today owe their production to solid carbon. We can think bigger than decarbonizing just one industry at a time. Come contribute your carbonaceous comments and constructive criticism. I lied. This is the last alliteration in the talk. If you have familiarity with strong opinions about or experience in any of the following research fields, uh, come find me, shoot me an email. I'll be at coffee with RPE. Um, I, I would love to talk to you. And with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Program Director, Dr. Olga Spahn. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for that introduction. Um, I'm Olga Spahn, and I'd like to talk to you about targeted energy delivery for industrial processes. So industrial processes uh, take up a large chunk of uh, US energy uh, produced annually. 35% of it goes toward them. And today, that energy comes from mostly fossil fuels that we burn. Uh, and that is not a specially efficient conversion. And furthermore, we generate a lot of carbon uh, CO2 uh, as a result. Not only that, but that energy is not utilized especially efficiently at the point of use, uh, that is at the industrial process. We waste more than half of it. And that is something we are working toward changing in the future, where we want to increase the utilization of that energy at the, at the industrial process itself, so we waste less of it. And we want to ensure uh, that that energy comes from renewable sources. And of course, then we have to worry about those renewable sources efficiently generating the energy. Um, my position is that those improvements in efficiency in both generation and utilization of energy will come from uh, power electronics, uh, among other technologies. And I hope to uh, illustrate that through this talk. But before I do that, I'd like to talk a little more about these processes. You've heard a lot from my colleagues about a variety of chemical processes that we use to produce fuels, industrial chemicals, uh, nitrogen fixation. You'll hear more about that from my uh, colleague, uh, Catherine Greco, here shortly. Uh, but also heating and drying, such as that in uh, paper industry or metallurgy uh, for, or uh, reprocessing. And also construction industry in the case of, say, cement drying. And those are industries that we have today. You can expect more industries to come online that will need energy uh, CO2 capture and, and reforming. Also, uh, fusion as a source of energy, for example. All of those need to be decarbonized. That means electrified. And they need to be electrified efficiently. And that can happen by uh, using power electronics, among other uh, technologies, to speed that along. So a little more about, about industrial heating in particular. That is the most energy-hungry industrial process, consuming more than 2,000 terawatt hours annually. I'm going to use cooking as an example. Traditionally, we cook our food in a pot on the stove or over a fire, or we cook in the oven. We're heating the vessel. We're heating uh, the air around our food. That's a con uh, convective or conductive process that does not deliver energy to our um, industrial material, in this case food, particularly efficiently. We heat a lot of things besides the food. Contrast that with cooking in a microwave. 
where your food gets heated volumetrically by interacting with microwave radiation. And that is a much faster, more efficient process as anyone who's ever tried to cook in a microwave knows. Uh, there are parallels in the industrial world. I'm going to use an example of cement drying. Traditionally, we do this in a rotating kiln where we heat the air around our cement by burning fossil fuels. Again, heat goes a lot of places besides the cement, not a very efficient delivery of energy. You could do the same with the microwaves, where you heat your cement volumetrically via microwave uh, radiation. And that can be much more effective in terms of delivering uh, heat to a process. Uh, another example I'd like to talk about is industrial chemistry. We heard a lot about that from my colleagues uh, prior to this talk. I'm going to talk about methane reforming as an example, but clearly there's other uh, processes. In this case, when you go from the reactant gases to a product, <clears throat> product, you have to overcome a large energy barrier. And you do that by generating high temperatures and high pressure so that your reaction can proceed. Uh, that involves burning fossil fuels. Uh, again, heat can go places you don't intend it to go. Not very efficient. Whereas this process can proceed at much more mild uh, environmental conditions or process conditions, almost room temperature and pressure, if you employ plasma catalysis. That's because combination of plasma and catalyst delivers energy to your reactant gases in a much more targeted way. So that the energy barrier that you now have to overcome when you go from reactants to products, it's much smaller. Thus milder process conditions. And the other nice advantage of this is not only is this more effective and efficient, it's more flexible. You can have a variety of feedstocks, you can have a variety of products, you can have a process that's scalable, uh, modular, and uh, continuous. And because all plasmas are generated and controlled electrically, they can be turned on and off quickly, which has advantages when you couple them to distributed energy resources uh, which are notoriously intermittent, uh, and that's a nice advantage. So there's different kinds of plasma out there. Uh, they, the plasmas can be uh, generated electrically, as I mentioned, and controlled electrically, and that's actually the proposal that I have here. But they deliver energy to the gas uh, in slightly different ways. Anything from vibrational excitation uh, of the gas molecules to outright breaking of those molecular bonds and creation of reactive species that uh, proceed, uh, the reaction will proceed much more readily for those. Uh, so ability to control and generate that plasma is important here, but not only that, you need to be able to uh, simultaneously engineer the catalyst and the gas flow because it's, it's really about the synergy of all three, the plasma, the reactant gas, and the catalyst that gives you those uh, efficiencies. And as far as the generation of, uh, for example, microwave uh, plasma, the way we do that today, we use power electronics to control high power vacuum tubes, which generate microwave fields, which generate the plasma. And that works, but it could be better. And one pathway to improving things is to replace those vacuum, uh, high power vacuum tubes with all solid state, high power, high frequency power electronics that not only control, but also generate the electric fields. Uh, but in order to do that, they have to perform at uh, powers and frequencies and, most importantly, efficiencies that they are not quite uh, capable of performing at today. Uh, but there is a lot we can leverage to make that happen, and if we do, we can realize a lot of improvements, uh, foremost in lifetime. Uh, we can also have new capabilities and flexibility and control, uh, potentially higher efficiencies reduced need for uh, rare earth elements, which are required for the vacuum tubes. And there is plenty for us to leverage. There has been huge advances made in electric transportation, starting with EVs, but also aviation and other areas that uh, can be traced to advances in power electronics. Uh, there has also been great progress and continues to be progress in grid control and management involving advances in power electronics. There is a whole area of military advances that we can leverage here, beamforming, antenna technology, pulse power, and so on, that also comes into play. So we need really designers for these materials, for our thermal management strategies, new circuits, um, to improve efficiency and power. But not only that, we need collaboration from plasma scientists, from chemical engineers and chemists, material scientists, 
uh, to improve our reactor co-design at the same time. This is a very multidisciplinary problem, and it's going to take a village to make an impact. So if you have ideas in this space, I hope you can uh, talk to me about them. I'm around uh, at the Coffee with RP tomorrow or for the duration of the summit, and here's my email in case you want to shoot me an email. Thank you. <laughs> My colleague. Yeah. Thanks, Olga. Today, I'm going to be talking about how we can rethink reaction pathways for more efficient and sustainable synthesis of industrial chemicals. The current state of A to B for industrial chemical production is um, a series of thermochemical reaction steps that are powered by fossil fuels. I'm here to argue that instead of electrifying each individual process step, electrification represents an opportunity for us to take a step back and reevaluate the pathways that we use to get from A to B, because there may be more efficient and direct routes. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about redox. So redox is a combination of the words reduction, which is reducing or gaining electrons, and oxidation, which is losing electrons. So redox just means moving electrons around. And redox is essential for industrial chemical production, as redox is used to produce chemicals that go into products like fertilizers, solar panels, plastics, and metals. And electrification represents an opportunity to use electrons more carefully. And this is important because energy requirements are directly proportional to the number of electrons transferred via the Nernst equation. And so if we can reduce the number of electrons transferred, we can reduce energy requirements. But the current A to B of industrial chemistry is full of unnecessary redox. So often we're oxidizing only to reduce, reducing only to oxidize, or going back and forth between reduce and oxidize. And so to take a look at why this happens, let's look at sulfur. Sulfur is primar primarily derived from natural gas on the state of hydrogen sulfide, which has a redox or re an oxidation state of minus two. To separate this out, it's oxidized to sulfur dioxide, which has an oxidation state of plus four. For purification, it's reduced to elemental sulfur, which has an oxidation state of zero. And then the final product is sulfuric acid, which has an oxidation state of plus six. And so each of these steps represents an unnecessary use of energy. And this is ubiquitous across industrial chemical production. But if we could have more direct pathways to get from A to B, there's a large opportunity to reduce energy requirements. And so to talk about some of the technologies and pathways that we can use to do this, I'm going to focus in on nitrogen. And so the motivation for focusing on nitrogen is that artificial nitrogen fixation is the highest impact industrial chemical process. And so if you look at the top five chemicals produced via industry, ammonia, which is the fixed form of nitrogen, has the highest impact in terms of both carbon dioxide emissions and energy use. And our demand for ammonia is projected to grow rapidly. Right now, we require about 200 megatons per year, but we're expected to need over 350 megatons per year by the year 2050. And this is only due to increased demand for fertilizer. It doesn't take into account the potential to use ammonia both as a green hydrogen carrier or as a green transportation fuel. And so we're going to need to fix a lot more nitrogen. But nitrogen fixation is really hard. So the nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is the strongest chemical bond that we know of in nature. And so it takes a lot of energy to break. Currently, we fix nitrogen via the Haber-Bosch process. So nitrogen and hydrogen are converted at high temperatures and pressures to ammonia. And this process requires a large amount of energy, about two quads per year, which is 1% to 2% of global energy use, and has a large emissions footprint, about 500 megatons of CO2. Let's take a look at what happens to this ammonia after we produce it. So ammonia is primarily used to make fertilizers, specifically ammonium fertilizers such as urea. But a significant fraction, about 10%, is used to make nitric acid. And so nitric acid uh, is the oxidized form of nitrogen. And so after we do all this hard work to turn nitrogen into ammonia, we oxidize a certain portion of it right back to nitric acid. Further, the impact of the Oswald process, which produces nitric acid from ammonia, is also quite large. And so in this first step, ammonia is oxidized in air. But ammonia can be over-oxidized to produce nitrous oxide. Now, nitrous oxide is a super potent greenhouse gas and has a global warming potential of about 273 times that of CO2. And the Oswald process is the single largest source of industrial nitrous oxide emissions. And so overall, the impacts of the Oswald process are about 150 megatons of CO2 equivalent per year, which is about almost one third that of Haber-Bosch. And this process requires 0.6 quads of energy use, even though this process is exothermic. So the question that we want to ask is, how can we leverage electricity to fix nitrogen? How can we use electricity to break this nitrogen-nitrogen bond? Fun fact, we actually used to use electricity to do this. So one of the first industrial nitrogen fixation processes that was commercialized in 1903 is Birkeland-Ide. 
So in this process, nitrogen and oxygen were passed over a plasma to produce nitric oxide. And this process was powered with renewable hydropower. And so in many ways, Birkeland Ide was ahead of its time. Eventually, it was replaced with the Haber-Bosch process. And the reason is that the Birkeland Ide plasma was extremely inefficient. And so the uh, energy required per mole of nitrogen was much larger than Haber-Bosch. And so Haber-Bosch is more economical. But with the advent of new technologies that could more efficiently leverage electricity, such as direct electroredox, non-thermal equilibrium plasmas, or protect perhaps other technologies that you all in the audience are working on, we have the potential to once again reduce energy requirements for nitrogen fixation and use green electricity to do so. So let's look at our paradigm for nitrogen fixation. Currently, we reduce nitrogen to ammonia, and then some fraction of that is oxidized back to nitrates. The most direct pathway would be direct electroreduction and direct electrooxidation. So you can think of this like the winged horse method. This is the most efficient way to get to where we're going. The problem is that, is that direct nitrogen reduction is extremely difficult. And so what makes it so difficult, particularly at aqueous and ambient conditions, are competing side reactions like the hydrogen evolution reaction. So when you pass a reducing current through an aqueous solution, protons can combine to form hydrogen. And so this hydrogen evolution reaction is the bane of many electrochemists' existence. It certainly was mine in grad school. And if we look at the electron efficiency, or the number of electrons that go towards our reaction of interest, which is nitrogen reduction, you can see that hydrogen evolution uh, by far outcompetes nitrogen reduction. The efficiency is somewhere between 8% to less than 1% for several recent studies. But a more efficient way to fix nitrogen could be oxidative fixation. If we pass an oxidizing current through aqueous solution, we don't have to worry about hydrogen evolution. We can go a step further and think about breaking this nitrogen-oxygen bond. So the bo nitric oxide bond is about 30% lower than the nitrogen-nitrogen bond, and so it could be a more efficient way to make green ammonia. And in fact, if we look at the electron efficiency of nitrate reduction to ammonia, it's already been demonstrated to have 100% electron efficiency. And so potentially, a better pathway to get to green ammonia production would be nitrogen oxidation and then reduction. And so then this could be a way that we can use electricity to put the horse back before the cart. But again, nitrogen is just one of several processes that we uh, use redox for and that could be, potentially be an opportunity for us to rethink pathways. And so in what other ways can we use electrification of industrial processes to rewrite industrial chemical reactions? And so if you have ideas on how to make this happen, you have different pathways that we should look at, or if you have technologies that we can use to get there, please come talk to me. Uh, I, myself and all of my colleagues will be available at Coffee with RPE tomorrow morning. And so with that, uh, we're going to move into the Q&A portion. OK. First question for Doug. Based on what geologists suggest, what else uh, might come up with natural accumulations of geologic hydrogen so, or other stimulated sources? So examples given were naturally occurring radioactive materials or geologic CO2. Um, you so what else comes up when we stimulate hydrogen? There's a number of gases in the subsurface that will come up. I mean, right now, probably the most important one will be the coevolution of helium. Helium is a natural, uh, naturally formed by the radioactive processes in the subsurface. Uh, we'd also be looking at potentials for CO2 coming out of the, the rocks and hydrogen sulfide gases. Um, be unique for each process. Thank you. Okay, Jim. Do you see any importance in developing reactors that don't need pure CO2 to produce fuels, like flue, glass or, flue gas or bicarbonate? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's, um, in the reactor system, you, yeah, you go either way, you can um, basically have the, it, there's so many different reaction pathways that can be explored, and I kind of listed a partially list of them up there. And again, that's why I'm reaching out to the audience and really trying to optimize, you know, what is the best way to hydrogenate CO2? That's a real good question. A lot of different people have different approaches. The oil industry has theirs. They've, um, with respect to reverse water gas shift, for example, and then, uh, and then going toward, uh, like, Fisher Tropes, going the syngas route. And of course, that's been around for 100 years through the syngas. And then there's a lot newer ideas coming out there. Uh, just talking to people before the discussions today, which kind of went through my head before answering the question um, that I've never even heard of before. So 
to me, this is a very, very exciting area. I'm very excited about exploring that further and really helping to find maybe what a proper program would be around those reactors. Thanks. For Joe, how much of industrial refining emissions can we attribute to the usage of coke versus other sources of emissions like hydrogen or process heat? Uh, that's a great question. And, you know, um, first of all, it's important to note that uh, coke is actually a source of a lot of the process heat that's being used uh, industrially. Um, if you look at uh, the proportion of industrial fuels that can be attributed to, uh, to coking, it's, my understanding is it's around 60 to 70 percent of that is currently used. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of industrial non-process heat uh, emissions are attributable to uh, the, the carbon that's used as a carbothermal reducing agent um, in these processes. Uh, so a substantial proportion. Olga, have you considered the energy or emissions impact between plasma heating versus inductive heating? Yeah, well, we, we haven't thought about that specifically, but that's certainly a good question to consider. Um, it's, I think they both do require power electronics, although not the same type. Uh, and uh, plasma, the inductive heating, and again, back to the cooktop example, you know, we use that today. Uh, we're not burning fossil fuels in that case. You're still dealing with the uh, conductive process. You're heating the surface and you're relying for the heat uh, to propagate, and you have to wait for that to happen. So there's that time scale question. Uh, whereas plasmas uh, can be more volumetric, again, depending on how you make that plasma, because there's different types. Uh, and so that's where a lot of engineering has to happen. Uh, so I guess the, the Weasley answer is kind of depends. <laughs> but that's, that's true, it really does depend. Doug, what are the hurdles for achieving geologic hydrogen at $1 per kilogram? Oh. <laughs> um, the, the, you know, the, the, that's being modeled right now, and, and the question is if we can use a lot of the technology that's out there for natural gas. Uh, $1 a kilogram could be attained if we get high enough flux of the hydrogen out of the ground. Uh, hence our emphasis on stimulation methods. And I do not think a dollar a kilogram is going to be too hard to achieve. Okay, question for me. Are there any easy wins or high priority processes to target for redox? So I think it's more about what we use redox to do today, which would be typically either for separation or for purification. So if we can have more energy efficient methods for separation uh, and purification and chemicals, I think that this could potentially be a way to kind of avoid unnecessary redox. Um, okay, Jim. Why do small reactors make sense instead of merely transporting to a larger scale refining or chemical plant? Well, uh, again, the, the, the reactor size need to be commensurate with the feedstocks uh, going into the process. Um, and um, in this particular case, when you're hooking up with renewables, um, uh, and it's a very energy intensive process on that front end, you're gonna have a much smaller reactor system because you have less hydrogen, less CO2 than available uh, to make these liquid fuels. Great. Okay, Joe, what happens to the CO2 resulting from a carbothermal reduction with a synthetic coke material? Isn't it the same problem if carbon is still the reducing agent? Why not switch to hydrogen? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what you're essentially achieving when you turn CO2 into carbon and use that carbon to, uh, to fuel an industrial process is you're doing uh, essentially... CO2, sequ uh, CO2 capture and drawdown on an infinite time scale. There's no risk of leakage, right? You've, you've, you've abated some finite amount of carbon dioxide that would otherwise be emitted. Um, and the ultimate goal here is really, again, circularity, where the, go where the site of, as, as the site of fuel production becomes the site of fuel utilization, you enter a completely circular reactor system where the CO2 coming out of the blast furnace uh, gets reduced back to CO or to carbon, then cy cycled back into the blast furnace, uh, and carbon's never leaving the system. And in fact, this is a, a, a virtuous cycle because the overwhelming majority of the impurities and poisons that are in a flue gas effluent stream, the things that would poison a CO2 reduction catalyst, are coming from your coke stream. So if you're making pure carbon out of your effluent stream, and then you're feeding 
that pure carbon back into the reactor, your effluent stream is even purer, and that makes it even easier to turn it back into carbon. Okay, Olga. Do you think incorporating power electronics brings up any challenges from a controls perspective, since electronics are usually more complex versus manual methods like kiln heating? Excellent question, and the answer is yes, but it's both a bug and a feature, right? It's, um, it's more complicated, but it offers opportunity for control that's unprecedented, right? You just can't do that with, with the present day technology. Uh, you know, the gyrotrons that people use in a lot of the uh, plasma processes uh, don't have the capability to be controlled as finely as you can with power electronics. And you may have like one or two or I don't know how many big sources. Whereas you can imagine almost like a beam forming idea with power electronics where you can direct the electric field uh, where you need it to be and dynamically modulate it as uh, things heat up, for example, as your material properties change. Uh, it's that interplay of the electric field, the catalyst, and the gas, right, uh, that puts the plasma where you want it to be because they all have to overlap in time and space. And you might have to pay the price for more complicated controls, but you might need that to really optimize your process. Okay, another question for me. I hear cement or iron and steel is the worst process with respect to CO2 emissions. Can you clarify where fertilizer production stands on climate impact relative to, the, to those two processes? So yes, that's true. For so industrial emissions, iron and steel and cement are number one and two. Um, and then the chemicals are number three and ammonia production is the worst of those chemicals. So it's relatively high impact. Okay, Jim. Oh, sorry, Doug. How will the drilling method of hydrogen manage the unique challenges of a slippery molecule to prevent leaking in a fragmented production method where infrastructure is brought in to drill, frack, produce, et cetera? Uh, that, that's a good question that I look at and say, I am a program director who's going to be putting out the problem. <laughs> and my expectation <laughs> is there's someone in this audience or they know someone who really will understand how to control and stop hydrogen from leaking. Uh, reservoir management and, and tracking that down is going to, it has to be a key component of any program in this. And again, my expectation as a program director is I put out the problem and the people out here uh, will solve it for us. Yeah. <laughs> Convenient. <laughs> All right, now it's your turn, Jim. Okay. What are the cost targets for the SIN fuels and the energy and cost of CO2 capture? Is that part of the cost? Oh, yeah, it's, it's the entire system and the cost is a real key part about that. And I think that's the exciting piece here is that um, on the syn fuel side, there's, again, a couple papers, independent papers from Argonne, from NREL, other places that if, if you could obtain a resource or your uh, inputs of hydrogen at $2 a kilogram, your CO2 at $100 a ton, it's then feasible to generate 4 to $5 per gallon of, of, of your fuel. All right, and that also includes this capital. And, and they did assess different uh, reaction schemes that have been around a while, so I can see an improvement from that. So I think that's the very exciting part. Of course, then to make it at the smaller scale, again, that's going to be you know, up to the audience to help solve these problems. I'm gonna go back to Doug's here. You, know, you guys are out here. I'll be happy to pay you the money if you can solve these problems for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joe. Is Syncoke a bridge technology that would be phased out once the high-cost capital equipment reaches the end of its lifetime? Oh, I love this question. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely, you know, I, I think that if you're looking at drop-in decarbonization, you know, if you look at the overall scope three life cycle emissions abatement, it's not 100%. It can never be 100% because of the laws of thermodynamics. So you can get maybe 80 to 90% carbon reduction if you're really good. However, Syncoke transitions seamlessly into geologic carbon sequestration because now you can couple Syncoke production with DAC and then take your Syncoke, put it in a coal mine, and we are unburning coal. It's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question for Olga. Semiconductor industry already uses power electronics generated plasma for some of the processes. Why do we need new improvements? So that's true. Uh, there are examples of industrial processes that already utilize power electronics for plasma generation, and that's found in, in semiconductor industry, in fact. A lot of the surface processes, plasma CVD processes, rely on 
uh, power electronics driven plasmas. But those are smaller volume uh, type enterprise and also the powers involved are lower. I mean, I think they top out at tens of kilowatts. Uh, and frequencies are tens of megahertz. And the high end are megahertz, the lower the kilowatts. Uh, and what we need for some of these fuel production, for example, or chemical processes, um, is, is megawatts, right? And potentially higher frequencies like gigawatts. Um, and, and the plasma uh, drivers for fusion are talking about hundreds of gigawatts and a lot more megawatts than otherwise. So there is absolutely uh, an existence proof, and then now it's a question of expanding the capability all the while increasing and improving the efficiency of operation. Great. Okay, question for me. In solar PV production, the successive reduction steps are needed to guarantee required semiconductor purity. How could a direct reduction of silicon dioxide provide this purity? Is that purity issue important to other reductions you want to change? So, yes. So I think that there are a couple answers here. So I think when you, if, if we were to switch to electrochemical reduction, this would be more pure. Currently, carbon is used for silicon dioxide reduction, and so you could lead to other, you know, silicon carbide or other uh, products that you don't want. So this could potentially help with the purity issue. But uh, in general, more efficient methods for purification, I think, are needed, like I mentioned. And so, yeah, purification is also used in the sulfur process that I was talking about before. So I think this could be, like, a potential for other industrial processes as well. Okay. So we have, like, a one and a half more minutes, and so I have a question for all of us. <laughs> so, uh, in addition to cleaner processes, would any of these ideas help with safer industrial processes as well? Safe. Coal mining is a risky job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We'd get, yes. Safer carbon. Yeah, and I would look at it and say that if you look at for many of the efficiency stuff we're talking about, Think about the mining of minerals required to power all these systems. Mm -hmm. And people forget about how much minerals go into all these processes, and mining is probably the most dangerous industry in the world. So whether it's coal or whether it's uh, the different metals that we use, the less metals that we use will inherently improve safety and, and health uh, mm -hmm. of the workers. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say yeah. that you are probably trading one problem for another, just to be honest, you know, uh, generation of plasma and microwave requires high voltages and maybe currents, and that's got its own dangers, so you just maybe trade one for the mm -hmm. other. We know how to manage that, you know, we have high power grid out there, and we manage not to electrocute people too often. So, <laughs> <laughs> presumably, we, we, there are ways of dealing with it, but it's not without, uh, you know, problems you will have to handle. And then again, um, more of a distributed fuel type of mm -hmm. um, architecture, uh, that, that is definitely going to be a challenge. Uh, the oil industry is a very, very safe industry. I think it's a very high standard, and they infuse safety culture within that industry, and that is going to have to also then be infused into this distributed fuels model. So that's a very good question. And not an easy answer. Right. Well, with that, thank you all so much. Uh, yeah, I would love to see you all a copy of RPE tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.